back to sleep. It's alright. Go on back to sleep. It's okay. Had too much to drink tonight. No. Huh? No drinking. Okay, right here. Good afternoon. Top of the morning. Top of the morning to you. What time is it? It's midnight. Midnight? Yeah. After midnight. Top of the morning to you. Yes. Same to you, sir. Gentlemen, what are you doing? Making oh, a movie? Making a sure. movie, yeah. Nice, nice morning. to see you. Nice to see you, too, everybody. Nice spot, huh? Get back to sleep. Sorry to wake you up. No, you ain't no bit like that. Time it is. Huh? Two o'clock. Two o'clock. Take my word for it. One fifty-nine. Right. Yeah. Two o'clock. Yeah. Right. That's, uh, What's your name? Huh? What's your name? My name is Laddie. Laddie, my name's Evil Knievel. Nice to meet you. Knievel? Yes, sir. You're not from Idaho. Idaho. Montana? Montana, yeah. No. Yeah, you know me, huh? I know. I still recall the day I set out on my own. Not much at all, but dreams to make it all go. But one man. I want to be involved in the making of this documentary. I'd like it to be the very best and the most truthful documentary that it could be. It's like when somebody does an autobiography. If they have a co-author, do they let a ghost writer write it? Sometimes it isn't the truth. But I know there's going to be things in this documentary film that people are not going to feel comfortable with or they're not going to like. But if we're going to tell the truth and show the truth, let's do it in the right way, in the right manner, and get the job done right. All right, hello there. I'm Bob Pavlovich, and I own the Met Tavern. I am a state legislator, and I live in Butte, Montana, and I am a friend of Evil Knievel's. I guess that's what this program's all about. We're going to talk about Mr. Knievel. kid when he was a young lad, when he was a rogue. I 
And I traveled him when he was a big shot, and he sat on top of the world. And saw him do some of his good work and some of his bad work. No, I don't think jumping the motorcycle did make me uh, famous or, you know, people use the term folk hero or hero. Being a hero in the United States of America is the shortest lived profession that anybody could ever hope to participate in. hope not to participate in. I think that the American public or the public in the North American continent and the free world identified with Evil Knievel because of the trials and tribulations that Evil Knievel went through. And the times that he got up when everybody thought that he never could. I wanted to live to fulfill a dream and I acquired a lot of fans on the face of this earth that pulled for me and prayed for me and wanted me to fulfill that dream. The bottom line is that a man can fall many, many times in life, but he's never a failure until he refuses to get up. My name is John Hughes. I'm the director of the Butte Silver Bowl Public Archives. For people trying to understand what Butte is and what Butte was and what it was like to grow up in Butte, I think an archives is a place where the beginnings of the story and sometimes the end can be traced. Butte, Montana has always considered itself to be somewhat uh, different. Butte tends to play by its own rules. People say what evil did was uh, something that was so dangerous that uh, it's hard to comprehend. One wonders if perhaps the life of the other people in Butte, working in the mines and having not only great physical damage, but the famous miners' con, miners' consumption, silicosis, which killed far more people than the accidents in the mines. One wonders if perhaps that uh, jumping with motorcycles was not a way to escape from that. In his own mind, uh, it was probably dangerous, yes, but it was also glamorous. Well, I thought I could draw quite a crowd for you. See, I do stunt jumping on a motorcycle. I build ramps. Boy, boy, you ain't telling me anything. I've had some of the finest stunt jumpers in the world in my shows. Two pickup trucks and then. That's 40 feet, boy. That's right. 50 bucks, win or lose. Do or die. 50 bucks, you got it in, boy? Bobby can even, I'll build my own ramps. In Evil's case, he was successful. quit high school or you're thinking about it, all that you can desire in life or want to be is what you can see immediately around you. And what I saw immediately around me in Butte, Montana was uh, a pimp with a shiny pair of shoes and a 49 Mercury. He uh, grew up in a tough neighborhood, I guess we all did in this town. Everything that my grandparents got, they worked morning, noon, and night for it. He lived with his grandmother all his life. Nothing was ever given to them, and nothing was ever given to me. He didn't really was with his mother too much. I either worked for it or stole it. Bobby was 17 and a half months, and Nick was seven months old when we got them. 
she was just like uh, just like a Mother Teresa to me. He said, seen that uh, Joey Chitwood show. We tried to stop him. We couldn't stop him. So we thought, well, we might as well join him. I'm Frank Monks Maskey, Vice Principal of Butte High School, retired. I can remember 30 years ago on this street, used to be kind of a hazard. Evil used to come up the street, trying to impress Linda. And then he'd come up, and he'd come down, make a wheelie around, come back up again. I'm Don St. John. I own the Harley-Davidson dealership in Butte, Montana. Am I supposed to be impressed? Yeah? I'm not. I don't appreciate boys trying to run me down with their motors. Back in the 50s, you could get away with a lot of things in Butte that you can't get away with now. I said, why won't you go out with me? But they don't go out with Hood. Hood? What makes you think of a Hood? Yeah. Riding motorcycles on sidewalks, riding them through stores. Picking up your girlfriend on the steps of the high school would be another thing. Hear to me. As far as kidnapping his wife off the stairs and taking her and getting married, I don't know whether that ever happened. Is it true that you kidnapped your wife? Of course it is. He did kidnap her, of course. What are you doing? That time. Never can tell when you're going to need it. And they were hunting for them all night long. The police were hunting for them, and we were hunting for them. But I know he did take off, and they, they eloped and got married. He, they took off. Uh, he was not uh, put in jail or anything. My name is Morris McKay. I'm a retired police officer. Well, there's a lot of stories about how Evil got the, the name Evil Knievel. I was on duty the night with Officer Dale LaBrush that Bobby Knievel became Evil Knievel right here in this cell. Wait a minute, you're, gonna, you're not going to put me in here with all them criminals. Damn right I am. Well, that guy's a thief, murder, oh. rapist. Oh. That guy was there to pimp. I've seen him before. He was working as a jailer. Answer yes when your name is called. Mitchell, Reeves, Razor, Corbett, Knievel. Yes, sir, I'm here. Canawful. There was a person in there by the name of Awful Canawful. What happened is Bill Awful Canawful was in this cell, and we put Bobby in this cell. Canawful? That's what it says here, Canawful. <laughs> We'd better double their guard. We've got evil Knievel and Awful Canawful. <laughs> we made the comment that now we got Awful Canawful and Evil Knievel. We're in for one hell of a night. <laughs> Who did that? Evil Knievel wasn't a bad kid. Evil Knievel was a typical Butte kid who wanted to do something better than work in the mines the rest of his life. Well, the reason you grow up different in Butte is because everybody is the same. Uh, it doesn't make any difference your father's a miner or your father's a lawyer or what, because they probably would be standing in the bar there drinking together. The town I was born in had more bars per capita than any, any town in the United States of America, and more whores. It's a working town and everybody works the same. There just isn't anything else to do there but go into a bar or a whorehouse. You get tired of going to the whorehouse, you go to the bar. And there's no class in Butte. That's what drunks do. They're just there soaking up alcohol. They're really hemorrhoids on the ass of progress. But Bob didn't want to work in the mines and work that. He always wanted to do something different. He uh, came up with a, a gimmick. This is a Anaconda Company warehouse where they stored dynamite. This is where Knievel got the dynamite blow up this building. The courthouse got broke into and there was only one way to get in. The courthouse was not blown up, the courthouse was burglarized. As to whether I did it or not, that's nobody's business but mine. That's the way it'll always remain. When he was a door knocker here, he used to come around my place and at uh, two o'clock in the morning and he was a merchant cop is what they called him. You know what that meant? He went around on the south side of town and he rattle doors and check windows and 
he was one of us. Well, when I was a merchant placeman, I had a deal. And he went to different merchants down on the south side, and he asked them for uh, a job. You don't want to give a little kid that's trying to make a dollar a, a $5 bill every 30 days to watch your place, and you might get robbed. That's what it amounted to. And of course, a lot of them knew Knievel. They said, we'd rather not do that. You pay me $10 a month, $5 a month to watch your place of business, you don't get robbed. They didn't have break-ins they had brakes. Well, I would have to say that he probably knocked over mine and about a dozen other on the route. They had brakes in their windows and brakes in their doors. He always had money, and he didn't make that kind of money knocking doors. And he'd come back the next day and tell the businessman, if I was watching your place, this wouldn't happen. And they'd hire him. Really, he told me he knocked over my place. He just might say that uh, they found out that my protection was well worth the 5 or $10 a month after not subscribing to it for a while. Knievel uh, likes cops, and cops like Knievel. You know, not very many kids are lucky enough to grow up in life to where they can admire or look up to a police officer. I think you'd better get out here. There were really some guys on that police department that I kind of looked up to, that I admired, that I respected. You might say I, I kind of went light on them kind of had fun with them. We chased Knievel around quite a bit. Uh, it got to be kind of fun after a while. Most times you chase him and you go have coffee again. Come on, Knievel. You know, I had fun with him. I could take that motorcycle where they could never take a police car. So if he didn't want to be caught, you didn't catch him. I let him on a wild goose chase more than once. But you knew who you were chasing. I give them a lot of credit for helping me during a trying time of my life and growing up. And I really didn't know that they were really doing everything they could from the bottom of their hearts to try and help me. And it's all we had to do was go get a warrant and call his home or his grandmother's home and say, we got a warrant. And he'd say, well, don't come down around here, I'll come up. He never had to go arrest him, he volunteered. I really didn't want to get busted or thrown in jail in my own hometown. He didn't want to bother his family. And Eagle ran from us, and uh, there was times we caught him, there was times he got away. There were some times when I wanted to get away from him that they did catch me, I'll admit that. You were lying to Evo. There was a lot of laughs about it. I think my arm is broken. They knew what a wild kid I was, and I think that's probably part of why I got through it all. And it was never nothing serious. He promoted a lot of dirt bike riding here in town now. I mean, you know, he got some racetracks going and that kind of stuff. He did a lot of flat tracking when he was probably around 20 years old. One of his major things around Butte was he would make bets with people, especially in the bars and stuff, of how far he could ride his motorcycle on the back wheel. There's only a few of us guys riding bikes then, attracting, uh, you knew everybody in town that had a motorcycle. And I know that he could ride it for over a mile on the back wheel. One of the worst accidents I ever had was this one in Barstow, California. I used to squat in the middle of a racetrack, and they'd run a motorcycle or a car right at me. I'd jump in the air and spread my legs, and it'd go underneath me. In this particular stunt, I got hit in the balls. Needless to say, I never did this stunt again. Knievel was a good athlete when he was in his youth. Before I was 19 years old, I won the Rocky Mountain Senior Men's Class A Ski Jump Championship for the third year in a row. He was a good football player. I was a good cross-country runner. Halfway basketball player, but he's a real good hockey player. I'm Leo Maney. I was uh, Knievel's hockey coach in his high school days. When he was playing hockey, and I says, why don't you run the team and let the other fellas take the guff? And he says, because I want to be in where the action is. But he was an individualist, and he, had ne he did not learn at any time we were associated with him this matter of team play, passing the puck to the other players. And he'd get the puck at one end of the rink, away he'd go, all by himself. He wanted to be into everything, be the 
biggest fighter there was. And when they cracked him, they really bounced him, but he would go down, and up he'd come, and fighting for the puck again. And I saw him get knocked over the wall one time, but he deserved it because he was in a fighting mood. His aspiration, I suppose, was to um, make the top ranks, maybe uh, NHL. And he had a team of his own at one time. It was called a Butte Copper Kings, or Butte Bombers it is. We got a picture of it here. Well, I was the owner, the general manager, the coach, the starting center defenseman, and I was also the guy that cleaned up the locker rooms after the game was over. And uh, at one time, he scheduled the Czech Olympic team across the street in the Civic Center. And they set it up, and he was the promoter, and he played about two and a half quarters. In the third quarter, he left the game. I was a little upset by the attitude of their, and the conduct of their coach anyway, who, uh, after the second period was over, demanded that he referee the game or he was going to take his team off the ice. And the first thing he did was throw me out of the game on a misconduct penalty. And rumor has it. And all the receipts were gone. Now, there was never no proof of that. The gate receipts didn't disappear. Now, they say he took the receipts. I needed that money, and I was strictly an amateur. You know, known Knievel, I'd probably say he did. I gave some to them and some to me. Because the Olympic Committee had to pick up the cab for the Czech team to get them back to Czechoslovakia. If you're going to do business with the Czechoslovakians, I suggest that you always pay them with a check, and then if you're dissatisfied with the business you do with them, uh, stop payment on the check. I guess we're going to talk about why Knievel became a motorcycle jockey. I think he grew up with it all his life. We were all hanging around the bar, and uh, there's a little Volkswagen parked there. This so one old guy said, one day he says, uh, you're so good on that bike, I bet you can't jump over that Volkswagen. He said, well, I got 10 bucks, says I can. So I got on the back of the bike. Bob went out, got back about 20 yards. And we opened over the Volkswagen. Hit the back end of the Volks, broke his back window out, bounced up on the back and up on the roof and down over the front of it. And I'm on the back end of the bike. And went back in the bar and says, where's my 10 bucks? I couldn't get off fast enough. Though. The guy's going to kill him, you know. But... <laughs> Teddy Roosevelt said one time that it's better to try and win glorious triumphs and victories, even though you're checkered by failure and fate, than to rank with those poor spirits who neither enjoy victory or defeat because they've lived in such a great twilight that they've never tried either one. So uh, rather than be a painter of the Brooklyn Bridge or work in the Lincoln Tunnel in New York City and suck all that carbon dioxide in every day and live in those ghettos, I decided to fly through the air and live in the sunlight and enjoy life as much as I could. And that's just what I'm doing. Where well, I can remember the time that Evil Knievel ripped me off for 30 bucks. I bought a bike, uh, went down when he had a store here in town Went down to buy a bike from him, give him a down payment on it, $30. He might have bought a motorcycle from me and paid me a down payment on it, and uh, he never got his down payment back. Went back to get the bike. He had sold it, and he never would give me back my money. He probably came in, wanted a motorcycle, and tried to con me out of one, gave me $30. Well, he went out of business shortly after, but... I probably took his $30 and went and had a beer with it. He never did forget it. In fact, he's told me more than once that he still owes it to me. But he'd rather owe it to me and cheat me out of it. If I owe him, I'd rather owe him than cheat him out of it. You know, they're talking about him being such a bad guy. This is all maybe about 20 or 25 years ago. Uh, we had a problem with our elk in, at our national park down here in West Yellowstone. And they were slaughtering the elk in Yellowstone National Park. Rather than being moved to other locations. They were all starving, so they wanted to butcher them all. And they were letting the elk lay on the ground and rot. Well, Knievel wanted to save the elk. So for a publicity stunt to draw attention to it, I hitchhiked back to Washington, D.C. I think if I'm mistaken, he just about walked the whole way. To see President Kennedy. That was probably Evil's first uh, move at, uh, at notoriety. I said, President Kennedy, if you don't stop the slaughter of elk in Yellowstone National Park right now, your son John John will look at the head of an elk on a nickel like my kids do the head of a buffalo. He liked to make it believe that everybody, that he was a big, and if you could use a four-letter word, but he's not. So within 48 hours, John F. Kennedy stopped the slaughter of elk in Yellowstone National Park, and I've always felt that I was the one that was responsible for that. You have to know the guy, the inner parts of him, because basically, really, it is really a nice guy. My name is Evil Knievel. I'm a professional daredevil. <laughs> I was a daredevil and in a frame of mind that I could do anything in the world. I had balls as big as an elephant. I had a devil-may-care attitude. If I had a bad guy attitude, it was because of where I had to be to get the job done. I wear a red, white, and blue number one on my 
shoulder because I think I'm the best in my business. You have to think you're the best, you end up dead. It was always scary from the very beginning. His first jumps, I know I, I would kind of hang on to his arm. I don't think it's easy for any woman to go through what my wife has gone through. I think I bugged him a little, you know, until he finally told me that to leave him alone because it was hard enough to make the jump without somebody bugging him. That's my way of life. They've learned to accept it. So I finally kept my mouth shut and let him do what he wanted to do. And this is the only thing that's ever made him happy. When you do what I do for a living, you have to have a positive mental attitude. And if that positive mental attitude doesn't work when you make that jump, you have to be man enough to handle the circumstances. In my case, I'm man enough. You have to have a certain mental attitude about this, out of step with society. You gotta go out there with an attitude to really grab somebody and beat them into the ground to be a champion, to be a winner. And I had to have a killer instinct in me to beat what was probably the toughest competitor in life to me, and that was father time, death. And I figure there are three mysteries to life. Who we are, where we came from. Why you do what you do and where you're gonna go. Nobody knows the answer to those questions. Well, I don't know why I did what I did. I did what I did, I do what I do because I'm evil Knievel, and I don't question it. Knievel is a competitor. He's born that way. I think he's also a great showman. No, I never thought that Evil Knievel would go on to gain the, the notoriety and the fame that, that, he, that he accomplished. But every time you turn around, the man was, was selling or promoting something. Evil Knievel Enterprises is headed by H. Carl Forbes. He's the president. Mike Rosenstein is the vice president. Carl Goldberg is the secretary treasurer. I've always admired the Jewish people for the business sense. So I created three Jewish names for my stationery, all fictitious. But I've always had those business managers. I've always impersonated them on the phone. Rosenstein made a deal for me at Caesar's Palace. I went up there one night for the Rouse Tiger fight to watch him fight for the middleweight championship of the world. And I saw those fountains. I thought, God, I've got to try and jump this thing. Jay Sarno was the executive director of Caesar's Palace. I don't know if any of you know him or not, but he built also Circus Circus. So I got to looking at this Sarno, and he was so fast, I didn't know whether I ought to approach him or not. So I went to a payphone, and I called him up, and I said, uh, this is Mr. Frank Quinn. I'm with Life Magazine. You know Evel Neville? He said, Evel Neville, who the hell is he? I said, he's this guy who's going to jump the Grand Canyon, so he's going to jump over your hotel. I heard about that night. He said, I don't know. I, he ain't going to jump nothing around here. It's a bunch of baloney. I got to go goodbye. He's real quick like that. So I waited another day, call him up. I told him my name was Larson. I was with Sports Illustrated. I said, you ever heard of Evil Neville? He said, Evil Neville. Who the hell is this Evil Neville? I said, he's the guy who's going to jump the grand. Oh, yeah, some guy called me yesterday about that guy. Said, I don't know. Something around here, something going on. I don't know. Call back, he said. So I waited two more days, and I called him back up, and I told him that my name was Dennis Lewin. I happened to know Dennis Lewin with ABC at the time. I said, this is Dennis Lewin from Wide World Sports. Do you know Evil Knievel? He says, Evil Neville, Evil Neville, Evil Knievel. Who is this crazy guy? He said, everybody's calling me up about him. He said, I think we got a deal with him. I don't know. Call back. <laughs> So then, the next day, Rosenstein got on him. I called him, I said, hello, this is Rosenstein. He said, who? I said, Rosenstein. He said, who the hell do you represent? I said, Evel Knievel. I said, he's going to be in your office this afternoon about 2 o'clock to see you about this big jump. He's going to make you famous. Nobody ever heard of this Caesar's Palace. So I go to the Sarno, knock on his door. Secretary lets me into these big executive offices. She runs into the back door. She says, it's him, it's him. He comes running out of his office. He says, kid. Where you been? I've been looking for it, he says.
But there's no unemployment insurance for motorcycle daredevils. And no hospitalization insurance. The film that was shot of the Caesar's Palace jump has been said by a lot of people who are in the film business to be one of the greatest pieces of film footage ever filmed. This was filmed by one of the most beautiful blondes. Her name is Linda Evans. And John Derrick shot the jump and the takeoff, and Linda shot the landing and the accident. You know, that's always convinced me that I know more about beautiful women than other guys do, because it took the rest of the men in America almost 15 or 20 years to wake up to how beautiful Linda Evans really is. John Derrick kept his word with me. You know, he could have taken that film and done something with it, but he gave me his word that no matter what happened, that that film would belong to me and that he would show it to nobody. And he was the only one allowed to film it. He was the only one I allowed to film it. And when I woke up in the hospital after being unconscious for almost 30 days, there was that film there and a note from John that said, you scared me on this one. I'll never film you again unless you have a parachute. Your pal John Derrick, here's the film I promised you. All right, now get it real close. Turn around, face the camera. Go ahead. The Caesar's Palace jump was really the launching of my career. Ah! Girls, I'm evil can evil. It's a pleasure to make you acquainted. Hello. Hi. Are you sure you're feeling up to it, evil? I mean, we can come back later. No, I'm not feeling up to anything right now. But I may be any minute. Evil is kind of special. He was a different person all his life. In the early part of his marriage, I think that he was tied up in his career and what he was going to do in life. Before I put the Evil Knievel Motorcycle Daredevil show together, I spent two or three years in Los Angeles. But that's a time that I'd rather not talk about during this documentary. I spent about $5 million on speedboats, yachts, and ships. The most beautiful yacht that I ever had was this 87-foot Broward that was built for me in Fort Lauderdale. Had some big parties out there. He's had some big parties here. I've been rich and I've been poor. Rich is a lot better. I'd rather live rich than die rich. But when he was in the crowd, he was king. And he acted accordingly. You know, he was the big shot and stuff like that. But he always treated us good. Yeah. jump that I made in Seattle. At the time I made it, I had staph infection. I made a practice jump before the big jump was moved out in the middle of the racetrack. the rear wheel off of the motorcycle. You represent adventure, danger, the excitement in life, fascination in uh, most people only fantasize about. God's that determination, I don't know what, but he is, uh, he is uh, he's a man of his own convictions, and I admire the guy for it. We figured he'd probably kill himself. <laughs> The Astrodome was something that I always was very proud of because I've been told I hold the attendance record there that I drew the largest crowds that they'd ever had for two days. really a big thing for me because uh, it was the first time I was ever there and I always wondered about it. just a great experience for me. It's just something that's very memorable to me, something I always remember. On top of that, the jumps were successful, and that meant a lot to me.
I mean, Joe Goody Goody or Joe Ice Cream isn't going to go jump no motorcycle over no canyon or try to jump a sky cycle across it. Anybody that can make a living uh, trying to do the inevitable, which is kill himself, uh, and come out on top. Even that little broad that gave you the kiss out there, she's pretty good looking. Yeah, she was pretty good looking. I'll tell you what, my old lady's got 10 years on her and spots her three kids. She's about twice as good looking. When I think about the Bobby Knievel and the Evil Knievel, you know, Bobby Knievel was in another life of mine. He made a lot of money, but he never changed a lot. When I went to California and decided to get into the motorcycle business full time and become a professional entertainer, the character Evil Knievel was created. Hell, he acted that way when he never had a dime. <laughs> Bobby Knievel never made me a dime. Evil Knievel made me about $60 million. Ideal Toy Company manufactured and distributed all of the Evil Knievel toy products and all the related items. The toy product grossed over $250 million in about 10 years. Regardless of how much money he made or what have you, I think he never really put a value on the money because I felt that he never felt he was going to be around long enough to enjoy it or spend it. And Evil Knievel spent $63 million. I don't know if this is the right thing to say or not, whether he was joking about it or whatever, but he said if anything ever happened to him and he had his money all in the bank, he says, the odds are that the banker would end up with all my money and my wife, too. I always kind of felt that one jump to the next jump, that whether he would make it or whether he wouldn't, uh, I think he always kind of anticipated that he wouldn't make the jump. You know, there have been a couple of jumps that I've made during my lifetime that uh, I always had a premonition before the jump that things were wrong. Maybe I'd done something I felt was wrong or that I shouldn't have done. It. Maybe there's some reason I couldn't make the jump right. I was going to get hurt. Uh, things that I really don't want to divulge. I mean, we all have things in our life that we think things go wrong because of. The Yakima jump that I made in Yakima, Washington at the Yakima Speedway was over 12 or 13 Pepsi-Cola trucks. I jumped it on an American Eagle motorcycle. It's a big 750cc, 1,000-pound motorcycle. This jump was sponsored by my good friends John Noel and Don Tremble of Pepsi-Cola Bottling Company in Yakima. Boy, I sure didn't want to miss this jump. It was a big one. I can just tell you, there were times during my life when I jumped that I absolutely thought or knew that I wasn't going to make it. to somebody that you're going to do something, you got to do it. Well, I just didn't have enough speed on takeoff. Boy, I'll tell you one thing. Football players fall down on AstroTurf, and rodeo riders fall down in nice, soft dirt or cow manure. But boy, when you fall off of this motorcycle at 60 or 70 or 80 miles an hour on the asphalt, there's nothing in the world that compares with it. It's just murder on your body. It tears you to pieces. And, uh, I got hurt very bad. I broke an arm and broke a collarbone in this jump. And... Is heart beating good? Yeah, heart beat good. A lot of the jumps I made, I jumped with my bones broken but steel plates inside of me acting as inner casts to hold my bones together. Look at those pants. Look how they held. They didn't move at all. There was a reason. I was on a schedule, and I had an obligation to meet as a performer to the public and to keep my word with the contractor that I entered into the agreement with. We were sitting in a cocktail lounge. The plate, the steel plate in his, in his left leg come through his skin. He yelled out with a yell. We rushed him to the hospital. 
The doctor operated on him or fixed him up. The doctor told me that if he had to go in the leg one more time, it was going to come off. The next day, he did the Plymouth jump. My doctor had to uh, give me something to quiet me the night before he jumped. He doesn't appreciate a thing I do for him. Because he was hurt so much. I do good, beautiful, rugged work. All he does is try to ruin it. I remember in Carson City, I knew that I couldn't make the jump, but I went ahead and tried it anyway. I ended up hurt very badly. I broke my hip. He had uh, so many broken bones that he decided he had to do something else besides ride a motorcycle. Look at the way those pins have. I'm going to put in the new ones just the same way. The painting was his next love. So he started to paint. Right after he did the Caesar Palace jump, uh, I think Carson City, he was jumping down there for, uh, in Sacramento, California, at the Autorama shows. He had a lot of time on his hands at that time. And he used to s sit around and watch me paint, and then I'd give him the brush and let him paint. That's how basically how we started it. And I paid for all of those operations from my own earnings. I didn't have any hospitalization insurance. I never had any life insurance. I was always self-insured. So when I fell off and got hurt, I had to pick myself up and go back to work because I was the only one that was going to pay the bills. Nobody was going to pay them for me. Before each performance, he, when he goes to the point of taking off his gold, his rings, his diamonds, his necklaces, his bracelets, and just handing them to his father and saying, Dad, you know what to do. We're out here overlooking the expanse of 17 vans and trucks. I walked it off myself, and it's well over 100 feet. He'll have to be hitting somewhere between 80 and 85 miles an hour when he hits off. They had the reservations about the jump because they really were in question about whether I could make it or not because I had been hurt before that. He's about ready. Here he comes. just before the jump because we thought it was going to rain. And to tell you the truth, none of us thought that I could make this jump in here. And I want to tell you something. You know, we sold this place out tonight, and I just as soon missed the jump as have them boo me out of here. And uh, I'm almost to the end of my road, and I'm not going to let that happen yet. I, uh, I'm going to jump uh, in Los Angeles, San Francisco, Tulsa, Kansas City, and then I make a big jump, a world record jump at the Canadian International Exposition of Toronto, Canada. And then we're going to the canyon Sunday, September 8th, and I'll see you there. Evil, it's lonely up there. Well, you're all alone, but you got somebody with you, Frank. I've had somebody watching over me for a long time. I'll never forget the time I jumped in the Cow Palace. I had a premonition that I couldn't make it. From the very beginning, things start seeming like they were going haywire. And the Hells Angels were there. Here come one of them walking right down in the middle of the arena, in the middle of the cow palace, giving me the finger, throwing the bird at me. There were 15,000 people in the grandstands, and here there were women and kids and every all families that came to see me. And you know, I always wanted to punch one of those bastards, and he was a, a little jerk, so I just rode my motorcycle up there and got off and just nailed him. Now four or five of his buddies jumped out of the grandstand, and they're all going to jump on me. The Hell's Angels are all going to gang up on me. So now the motorcycle racers and the people in the grandstand, the San Francisco people, boy, they went after those Hells Angels, and when it was all over, they hospitalized six of those Hells Angels, and two of them were in intensive care for, like, months. On this particular night, he had a lot of pressure on him. But I could hear that the bike wasn't sounding right when he was making his approach takeoff. I knew myself, just by looking at that setup, that he had not much of a chance to make it. 
I knew because of the takeoff ramp situation in the landing area. He had two pillars that he had to maneuver that bike through, and I just didn't think he had enough room to do it. These three guys, Roger Raymond, Ray Gunn, and Jack Swank, have always taken great care of me. And everybody in that audience seemed to know that Knievel was not going to make that jump. There was no way that I could, uh, you know, that I could do it. And I asked him why he ever attempted to do it, knowing that he couldn't do it. And he said to me in return, he says, what the hell do you want me to do? Give them their money back. After I landed, the motorcycle went upside down on top of me and hit some obstacles out in the gateway going out of the stadium. And, uh... and to be honest with you, I thought he was dead. I'm lucky that I didn't get killed. You know what amazed me about him this time? What? His arms and legs, they were all pointing in the right direction. During a course of the three and a half years, I underwent 14 major open reduction operations where they would cut me open, put steel into me, or take it out of me. back at the Los Angeles Coliseum where some 25,000 people are waiting for Evil Knievel to make another one of his spectacular motorcycle jumps. Evil Knievel's gonna make it. Evil gonna make it. Time over 50 cars stacked up in the center of the field. I think Evil Knievel's not gonna make it. I'll come. Too, too high and too far. When I performed at the LA Coliseum, I built a huge ski jump ramp had two men at the top of it grabbing me at the top so the motorcycle wouldn't flip over backwards on me. And during a practice session, it flipped over backwards anyway. I got, I broke my finger during a practice session. We're now at the 51st row at the Los Angeles Coliseum. This is where the ski slide-like takeoff ramp has been mounted with a 200-foot in-run. Now, ideally, he would like to take off at 100 miles per hour on the in-run. When you come down the ski jump ramp, you take off, you shift gears twice, and when you hit the bottom of it, you shift gears again. And sometimes you miss a gear, and when you're on one of those ramps and you can't get off, and you hit for that takeoff ramp, and if you've missed a gear on that motorcycle, you're going to crash. And you can really feel the tension mount here. A heretofore unaccomplished run. This crew has been with evil all during the tough and trying days. They've seen success, and they've seen failure and there's a noticeable air of nervousness and tension. Evil, not even wanting to look down that ramp. This ski jump ramp was probably the highest ski jump ramp that I ever had to start from. And needless to say, I was nervous about it, so were all the fellows that were with me. You know, there's a lot of things that enter into it. You just don't do that motorcycle jump by being ballsy. There are a lot of guys that got a lot of guts, and uh, they get on a motorcycle and head towards that takeoff ramp, they're gonna end up dead. In fact, my dear friend J.C. Agajanian, he was down on the floor of the stadium, and I know that he was more nervous than I was because he'd seen me hurt the day before, and he was worried that I was going to get it again. I think there are 5% that come see you die. There are another 45% that don't want to see you die but want to be there if it happens because they don't want to miss anything. Then the other 50% are on my side, and they're pulling for me. I had a parachute that I used to blow out to help slow me down. Actually, even though the parachute came out, I went up over the top and jumped out the other side of the Coliseum and ran into a chain link fence out there. You had a beautiful home out the country club here on the 16th hole. You wouldn't believe it. I mean, he built a beautiful home. I don't know how many hundred thousand dollars it cost. He loved that house. He put a fence all the way around it. It was a, a real show place uh, for Butte. He had beautiful horses out there. My wife has been both their mother and their father most of the time since I travel so darn much, so I feel I got to be a pal to him. Start that bike up. Let me see this from here. I want to show you guys something. Todd, watch this. I want to show you something. You know, you're hitting this log a little bit too fast. The jump I made at uh, CNE in Toronto was uh, just before the canyon jump. All right, now watch this. The front end bounces it up on the skid plate. I always wanted Kelly and Robbie to perform with me. You guys give them one final check over before tonight, and we'll be all right. Robbie, you want... what the hell's this? Look at this. You want to get hurt? Why don't you change that? 
You're not supposed to have a, a brake lever like that. I want you to get that fixed before tonight. Do you understand? And make sure you wear that helmet. Let's go home. Come on, we got to get some rest. You know, that was the last performance I might ever be able to make, and I wanted him to do it. Let me show you what you're about to see here today and why more than 22,000 people are here in this football stadium tonight. He will travel up this ramp and try to fly across 13 parked Mack trucks. I think I've probably become immune to pain. I do not have a high pain threshold. However, I've learned to live with pain for so long that I think uh, what would hurt an average person doesn't hurt me so much. Each truck is eight feet in width. The total distance, 104 feet. You're doing something that when kids imitate without your expertise, they can easily hurt themselves. It could, but I did it when I was a young kid. I imitated auto daredevils. This man is used to daring do. This man is used to daring because that's literally his life's blood. I cannot understand why a mother or a father who had a little child would not want that little child to take a risk. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, let's give a great Canadian welcome to a man who is known throughout the world as the last of the gladiators, the all-time king of the daredevils, Evil Knievel. I would think that a, a responsible parent would want a kid maybe to be uh, uh, an O.J. Simpson or a or an A.J. Foyt, or uh, uh, be like Evil Knievel. A little Ringley, a little Barnum, uh, a little Bailey. A commitment to the man is sacred. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would want my own children to be, even after what I've been through. In fact, I hope one of my sons will continue to do what I have done as far as successful jumping and performing goes. You know, I have a special night tonight because I have two sons. It was a good feeling for me because I had my sons with me. My son Robbie and my son Kelly. And I always wanted them to perform with me and do some writing under my guidance at the last performance I would ever have before the canyon jump. And this is that performance. And I would like you to meet my sons, Kelly and Robbie. My father had it so we grew up, so we were as normal as possible, but he showed us a lot. The sons, Kelly, 14, Robbie, 11. There's a daughter, Tracy, 9, and the mother, Linda's also in the stands tonight to watch this effort over the 13 Mack trucks. I'll never forget Kelly did wheelies standing on the seat of the motorcycle. This is Robbie. Look at this little guy go. Robbie, he was popping his little wheelies back and forth all the way across the field. He even did better wheelies than I did that night. He kind of stole the show, but... I was so proud of my kids. Do you expect to die while jumping? Mm, I hope not. Next, we have the real thing. I hope to be 101 years old. And you're in bed with some good looking gal. Welcome back to C and E Stadium here in Toronto. I would like to direct something to you who might think taking a narcotic is the wise thing to do, and I will give you something to relate to. I go to Indianapolis every year with the AJ Foyt Pit crew. He does a good job there. The men that are with him do a good job. When we go to qualify, there are some men who want to qualify and go faster. And instead of running on the fuel that Mr. Holman advises they run under and that the USAC committee tells them to run under, some of them cheat a little bit to get ahead and they use the nitro. And their car runs for about five laps and then it blows all the hell. And that's what will happen to you in life. If you take narcotics, you'll run for five laps and you will blow all to hell. So the decision is yours, you make it. I don't want to go to the kind of a heaven that uh, some of these fellows preach about. I mean, let's say I died and landed in heaven. Bang, I'm there, okay? 
And here I'm sitting there in a white robe on a hard marble slab next to JFK, Martin Luther King, and some pope. Now, what the hell would Evel Knievel have to say to any of those three guys? I couldn't carry on an intelligent conversation with him. I went to Idaho, and I bought a canyon. It's my canyon. And on September the 8th, I'll jump it. And the only way they'll get me out of the air is to shoot me out with an anti-aircraft gun, because I am going to go, believe me. Are you ever afraid? If I am, I'm not going to tell you about it. Why? I've been concerned. I'm evil can evil, honey. I'm not supposed to be afraid. And now you hang on to your seats and all hang on to the handlebars and we'll get this Harley Davidson over these Mack trucks and get this thing done. Thank you very much. And everybody was real nervous because we knew if I didn't make that jump that I wouldn't be able to make the canyon jump and everybody had so much money involved in the canyon jump. He'll probably be doing about 75 or 80, I imagine. I was paid a lot of money by the Canadian International Exposition to come to Toronto, and I wanted to do it because it was going to help with the big expense I'd gone to at the canyon. This is the moment of psych. This is the moment where he sells himself on the idea that he can do it. He's done it so many times before, but every circumstance is different. Every obstacle is different. Visually, it is different. It is a long way across. I think maybe the thing that helps me most of all is uh, before I get ready to go, uh, the little prayer that I say that uh, kind of helps me get across and maybe the prayers that I can feel coming across the field from the grandstand. Many, many times we thought he was tempting fate too severely. What about this time? We shall see what we shall see. Absolutely perfect. He hit it right on target. And listen to the crowd. And on September the 8th, after the canyon jump is over, I hope that I'll see you there and uh, we'll have a cool one together. I can jump easily. It's got draft beer that doesn't make you fat. It's got a lot of beautiful girls like you running around. My wife won't get mad if I go out with any of them. <laughs> and my kids stay small all our lives. Well, that's kind of a heaven I'd like to go to. I first came in contact with Evil Knievel about five years ago when I got a call from his agent in California. I made a deal with uh, the Qualls family there. At that time, Evil was considering jumping the Grand Canyon and uh, couldn't make uh, connections with the government, so he came into Twin Falls and took over uh, some property out here and uh, now is planning to jump the Snake River Canyon. The Snake River Canyon jump, uh, you know, was something I worked at for seven years to do. And when they fire that sky cycle of mine, it's going to go from zero to 200 miles an hour by the time it reaches the end of that. And what that takes is 5,000 pounds of thrust. 15,000 pounds of jet horsepower and 4,000 pounds of total impulse. And this uh, sky cycle runs on steam. It's a steam powered vehicle. We heat water in a heater to 700 degrees and then let the water from the heater into the sky cycle. They do the countdown and, and let the thing go. And the man who has designed the vehicle for me is a fellow named Bob Truax. Bob Truax was one of the pioneer engineers with NASA and he also was one of the pioneers of the Polaris program. There were a lot of people that thought that it was a crazy stunt, that it could never be done, and it was just for publicity. Well, I want to tell you something. When it's all over, I'll be one guy that will come back across the other side and say, I told you so, because I am going to jump him. And when it 
comes down on the other side, maybe they won't think that uh, Evil Knievel was so crazy. test firings down there that he had two prototype sky cycles and I was there on both tests and both tests failed When I think back on it, and I think about the word ripoff, you know, I fired two test shots to try and make the test shots go across the canyon. They both went right into the bottom of the canyon, right into the river. And I ran out of money, and I only had one left. I had to get in it and try it. I just kind of think that he was backed up against the wall publicity-wise in such a big scale he couldn't get out. before he even made the Snake River jump. You know, it's a party in town. We started at the freeway, and went up the Acoma, came here, and we went out the Elmar. And he probably had, I would say, about 600 people or better follow him. You couldn't move in this place with the amount of people that were with him as they went around to the different places. He probably spent, oh, I would say about 15 grand that night, if not more. And the drinks were on him all night long. He did things like that. I'll never forget that flight I had in that helicopter across the, the field from the airport to the canyon site. I was seeing the sun set that night, you know. But I, I, I knew I'd see a sunrise because I was going there again in the morning, but I wondered if I'd ever see another sun set because the canyon jump was at 12 or 1 in the afternoon. We're one minute and counting. One minute to go, one minute. The weather conditions were, was not in his favor. Truax wanted to back out on it, cancel the jump, and Knievel wouldn't go for it. I put my whole heart and my whole life and my whole soul into that canyon jump. I'll never forget the night before the canyon jump. I made a deal with my son, Kelly. I said, now, tomorrow, when we get in the car to go to the airport, I want you to pretend that you left a little shaving kit in the house and you got to run back in for it. I said, I had a picture made for your mother here. And if I get killed at the edge of the canyon, I want to make sure this is hanging on the wall over the bed when she comes back to this bedroom tonight. So what I had done was got a picture of the Snake River Canyon without the sky cycle or the ramp or anything in it. And I had written in the sky to my darling wife, Linda, I love you, and signed it, Bob. So when we got ready to leave for the airport that morning, Kelly pretended he'd left something in the house, and he ran back in to get his little shaving kit. And what he did was get that picture out from underneath the bed and hang it on the wall. I'd like to ask everybody in the booth right now to be silent. Uh, Jim, all I can tell you is uh, happy landings, Evil Knievel. I don't know what to say. I've never seen anything like this. I seen the look in his face, and I seen the look in the, in the face of his wife and his kids. I was there when the priest gave Knievel his last rites. I mean, I know what men like Gary Gilmore felt when they stood in front of an executioner. I was a dead man. I never thought that I had a prayer. I don't really think Knievel felt that he was ever going to make that jump. I didn't think that thing would get 10 feet. And I hope that no one ever sees in their wife's eyes and in their children's eyes what I saw in my wife's eyes and my kids' eyes the night before that jump. My wife was petrified. And I hope nobody ever has to say a prayer like I said when I punched that fire button. Four, three, two. I just said, God, take care of me. Here I come. One. Whoa, it looks like a good one. Whoa. Oh, evil, stay with the bird. He looks like he's... 
Whoa, th there's been a mistake. He looks like he's going into the canyon. The ship's going down. It's, it's going down. As the vehicle is going down, the wind is blowing me back into the canyon wall. Uh, I'm fighting, trying to get out of it. People didn't realize it, but I was trying to cut myself free. I was tied in that thing. It looks like he's going into the canyon. That's it now. There she goes. Beneath the roof of the canyon, he's, he's going to crash. Now he's coming down about 17 feet per second. Slowly going down. Boy, it looks like he's down in the water. The family, we were racing around to them now to get their, their hysterical and in shock crying. Looks like the boy's down in the water. Uh... No, I'm afraid he's down in the rocks on this side, but I can't see. It looks like he's in the water. Robert Craig Knievel appears to have landed in the Snake River. I think evil may be dead or he may be drowning in the river. I don't think I could ever explain to people really how tough it was on me to jump the canyon and what it was in my family. Robert Craig Knievel did not clear the 1,500-foot Snake River Canyon. If that would have gone in the river, I would have absolutely drowned. I was a dead man. Let's quickly see again what happened. Here it is, the rocket ready to go off the pad in a burst of white hot steam. What went wrong? I waited seven years and then had an engineering mistake made, a malfunction. The parachute blew out on takeoff because of an electrical malfunction. You know, now when people really realize what happened, the malfunction that I had and how I could have been killed, it's no different than the malfunctions that NASA has when they try and fire an astronaut into space. We burnt three astronauts to death at Cape Canaveral. It did not damage their credibility. I especially think about the terrible accident just a few weeks ago, now losing our six astronauts and a beautiful little school teacher in this Challenger tragedy that was a sad day for, for America when that happened. But I think people are aware of the fact now that disaster can strike, a malfunction can happen, and nobody can do anything about it. You're in it, and you've got to be able to pay the price no matter what it is. Once you're committed, there's no backing out. You know, there'll be a lot of space shots in the future that people will be in, and they'll be successful. Who knows? Maybe someday somebody will even jump the Snake River Canyon. It'll be successful. Evil Knievel now appears to be standing in the boat and waving. He's alive and well. How I ever made it, how I ever lived, is just a miracle. He's okay. Twin Falls, Idaho, they have a monument by the bridge. It's a dedication to the jump, and as far as I'm concerned, it's one of the greatest compliments that was ever paid me. In every adversity, there's an equivalency to benefit if you just look for it. And as far as I'm concerned, if I'd have made it across the canyon, everybody would have said, well, it's easy, I could have done it. If I'd have died, they'd have said, well, a daredevil died. Evil Knievel, that was his grand finale. But excuse me, I didn't. I'm still alive. The toughest competitor that anyone ever has to face in life is death. And death was my competitor. I wanted to get on the motorcycle and go against death. I was a life risker. I was not outside of the arena looking in. I was in the arena. To be like, like a, a life risker or a, or a gladiator of old times, that's what made my life worthwhile at that time. I uh, sometimes think that maybe I should quit, but you always want to keep going. And I'm kind of proud of that red, white, and blue number one I wear on my shoulder, and I want to keep it on there. I'm glad you're here today. You know, I've never had an accident when you're around. Now, the first person to be beheaded here was Queen Anne Boleyn, the second wife of Henry VIII. Well, I think he's mad. <laughs> Queen Catherine Howard, the fifth wife of Henry VIII was beheaded here. I've always been very proud of the London, England performance at Wembley Stadium. He's American. Mr. <laughs> Knievel. I was proud of the fact that so many people had turned out to see me. And before I arrived in London, they only sold 7,000 seats. I wouldn't want to be him. No, You're risking your life all the time. Well, I think it's a bit <laughs> stupid. <laughs> There's another football game between Scotland and England. I'll be in good, good grace with the Scots. Let's go. You. When I arrived there and started to do my interviews for television and radio, the seats really started to sell them. Oh, well, he takes his life into a risk. I don't know much about him. Just that he's broke every bone in his body except his neck. <laughs> I was really talking about, at the time, what a great country America was and a brother and a sister America was to, 
to England because it was a time they were going to have an election over there, and most of them were card-carrying communists, and I really got on their case about that. He's a bit of a nut, but he'll make it, though, because he's good and he's the greatest stunt man in the world. Hi there. Can I have a shake How are you? Wish you all the best. Thank you very much. Thank you. I don't really know about Abel Naval. I drew over 100,000 people to the stadium. That's more people than they ever drew there for a soccer game between any two countries. It's a turned-on crowd at Wembley Stadium as Evil Knievel returns to action. I'll never forget, I was with Frank Gifford uh, from ABC before the jump. Just before he came out and made his appearance, he almost dozed off in the booth. I looked out the window of the dressing room and I said, Frank, what in the world does a person have to do to draw this many people to a stadium? And I realized that I might be slow on takeoff and I might not make it, but I knew Harley Davidson could never get the parts to me fast enough to change the gearing. He'll be doing about 90 miles an hour when he leaves the ramp. So I went ahead and tried it anyway with the gearing that was on it. Evil has been doing this for the here he goes, and he will go. The man you see leaning over him is this mechanic, John Hood, who uh, is also a close friend. The other man is obviously a doctor. You know, I was hurt so bad after that jump. They never thought I was hurt as bad as I was, but I broke my pelvis right in half. I'm lucky that I wasn't killed. I was unconscious and up and in shock and, and uh, could hardly get out of the place. I really didn't know whether I was going or coming. You know, we were on the air satellite and we were live, the ABC network back to the United States. And, Frank was so upset with it when he saw me crash that he dropped the microphone, the ABC microphone, and ran down to help me. Ladies and gentlemen of this wonderful country, I've got to tell you that you are the last people in the world who will ever see me jump, because I will never, ever, ever jump again. I am through. Believe me, after missing 13 buses in London, England, and then coming to Kings Island and jumping 14, don't think I wasn't nervous. The Kings Island jump, which was over 14 Greyhound buses. John Hood is there with Evil Knievel, discussing whatever you discuss at this moment. The people at Kings Island were so great with me. They're such a fantastic group of people and such a beautiful place there at Kings Island outside of Cincinnati. They did everything they could to make it as safe for me as possible. The whole concentration now is getting that bike off the approach ramp and onto the landing ramp. And he's not hesitating, he'll go. Boy, there's never anybody glad in the world that it was over than me when that jump was over.
really was the last big jump that I ever did, which was successful. Thank you. You know, I, I landed on number 14. I, I didn't get all the way across it. This motorcycle is the finest machine in the world as far as I'm concerned. It broke in half, but it held me up. And all I can say is thanks to number one, thanks to Harley Davidson. You've been so good to me through the years. And I really wanted to quit then. Uh, it was the first jump that I'd made that was successful where I thought, now maybe I might hang it up. I did this, but uh, of course I went on from there. I made a statement at my last jump in Ohio that uh, the motorcycle doesn't have wings, and a man who's supposed to be a professional ought to realize when he's jumped far enough to the, to the point of no return. And I think I've reached that point, and I think the best thing I can do now is put on the shows and try and provide the best entertainment possible and uh, try and stay alive and not get hurt anymore. Here in the Seattle Kingdom, even though it's called the Kingdom, I didn't have much room to get more than seven or eight Greyhound buses. I believe he's going to go. And even though it was a short jump, it was a dangerous jump because of the ski jump ramp, and I actually threw my shoulder out of place when I landed. This was kind of towards the end of my career when I was really thinking about quitting. Then we'll take a look at it quickly from another angle. You saw what happened here tonight. You saw the motorcycle nosedive. I really didn't do it right. The power curve was wrong, and even me, after jumping for 12 years, I even make mistakes still now. So remember what I told you. If you're going to jump, you're going to race, you're going to have fun in life, make sure that you take every safety precaution you can, just like I do. The jump that I made over the Sharks in Chicago was probably a jump that really helped me make my mind up that maybe I'd had enough and that I'd end my career. He got hurt real bad in Chicago. It was on a national television show that they were supposed to do. I broke both arms. I had a severe brain concussion. He was doing a trial run, a practice jump, and he miscued. When I fell off the motorcycle, it was the first time I'd ever hurt anybody in 16 or 17 years besides myself. And ended up going into television equipment. I hit a cameraman. I understand that he uh, has lost an eye. And he got busted up real bad. But on top of it, the television critics gave that show the worst television show award of the year because of the way that it was directed and produced. And as a result of that, I think they, they had to cancel out on the telecast. That show helped me make up my mind. It was just the end of it. I didn't want to continue it. But from that point on, he got broke up so bad that he realized that his career at that time was over with. I felt so bad about it that I didn't feel it belonged in this documentary, and that's why it's not in. You turn 40 years old and uh, you realize that the price you have to pay for success, if you've achieved success and been a champion of what you've done, that you may not be able to pay the price anymore. You know, I've performed before kings and queens and princesses and presidents and, and hundreds of thousands of people and I'm just not capable anymore. Nobody likes to live like a king and then all of a sudden realize that you're your throne may be jerked out from underneath it. I had a lot of friends, especially in Chicago, friends that were really beloved pals that went through me at a tough drinking time, at a tough time when I, I really kind of lost control and didn't know which way to turn. What happened to Evil Knievel? I'm not sure that I have any kind of an answer on that. This book was written and released in 1977. Now, that was three years after the canyon jump. I was uh, nearly 40 years old. How can we explain going after an author who's just written your biography with a baseball bat? I've talked to people about it, and I've heard people make the statement that Knievel, that, that part of his life, was at a point where he actually thought he was some sort of a god. I'd come to the point in my life when I didn't want to continue anymore. In order to understand, to begin to understand, it's necessary to understand that Butte has always had its own rules. With this book, Evil Can Evil on Tour, everything I ever stood for to the public, to the kids, was lied about. I've never even seen the book, so I don't know what he, he said about Bob in the book at all. But evidently, it was not nice because uh, uh, he went after him. The rules are there. Uh, you learn them by growing up in Butte. People 
kind of have a misconception about how this might have hurt my career. In 1977, I was done performing. My son Robbie was starting. They're never written down for you. I didn't booze every day. I absolutely took no narcotics. None. Never took a narcotic. And I certainly didn't hate my mother. The guy that wrote this book was lucky I didn't kill him. One of the things that you learn is that uh, when something happens, you take care of it yourself. I took a baseball bat and broke this guy's arms. It's generally short and quick, and uh, that's it. And that's the way you do it, Ronnie. I mean, you've got a problem, you go yeah. take care of it yourself. When I first thought about it, I was so irate that what I wanted to do was get this guy, strip him, hang him on the corner of Hollywood and Vine from a light pole. And I wanted to take this book, cover it with Vaseline, and stick it right up his ass and let him hang there. No one can evil ask an evil. That wouldn't be hard for him to do. And I thought, well, maybe you're better off rather than shooting this guy to bust his arms with a ball bat so that he can't write anything else about you. He just wanted to to uh, get a message across. The guy gets bad mouth to your family yeah. and your <laughs> and stuff like that, you go take care of it. So I caught him at 12 noon on the 20th Century Fox parking lot. Some of the rumors uh, indicated that uh, evil did not go in alone. And I had a man hold him because I didn't feel the filthy little bastard was worth killing. I had two broken arms, a cast on each arm. The people of Butte were confused about that. Felt he might take the baseball bat away from me and hit me with it. It's all right to go after somebody with a baseball bat because you can figure that uh, they should know how to defend themselves. I used the bat on him, very carefully broke his arms. People of Butte do not understand ganging up on somebody. But I don't think that he ever intended for it to go as far as it did. When I was done, he looked at me and he said, well, what did you do this to me for? And I said, for what you wrote about my mother, I should have killed you. And that's the way people have been in Butte for many, many years. <laughs> yeah. But I don't think that he will ever realize it would go to that extent either. I was sentenced to jail for three years. I did six months. The people in Butte didn't think that was bad. He says if he had to do it again, he'd do it the same way. I'm glad it's over, and I'm glad I went. Thinking back on it now, I'd say if he, if I was to ask him that question today, I think that he'd be, his attitude would be a lot different. The next time, I'll handle a little differently. The next time, I'll send somebody. I think the reason that the judge gave him six months is uh, probably because he was a celebrity. There is a term called freedom of the press. The facts are still open. I don't know them. They never meant for that term, freedom of the press, to be violated like it's so flagrantly violated in this country today. It's my job to look at them after they're recorded. It's been six or seven years since this leper was awarded $12 million. It's been ordinary, and he met a guy around here in a bar, and that he'd have, he'd have called him outside or drug him outside, and they'd had a fight, and it'd been over. He has never received one single dime, and he never will. He'll never get one single dime. I'd rather die. It just comes to a point where everybody needs to be needed, to be loved by someone. And I felt my husband came to that point when he lost everything. I imagine it would be like if any of us lost anything we really appreciated or put our best into it, it'd have to hurt. It's still Knievel's house. It's not introduced to, is the man who owns it now. It's the house Knievel built. I think that I began to feel so bad from the alcohol hangovers, traveling alone like I did, partying, partying like I did, that I really felt that I was beginning to lose touch with reality. He felt that he'd never run out of money, and when he did, it was a shock. And I thought to myself, I've got a, a beautiful family, I've got a beautiful wife and a little baby, and uh, there's more to life than just wasting yourself. Uh, on alcohol. And so it took him a couple of years to get over it. And you're surrounded by people that realize that you're drinking too much and they care enough to try and help you. I feel that God um, loved him enough to give us this little girl. When I pray and when I, 
when I question God about God, I always say, God, if you're really there, since I'm alone driving this motorhome down the road, I'm between Albuquerque and Phoenix, prove to me that you're here. Send an angel down here in the middle of this road. In which God placed a special love within her because right from the beginning, she just loved her daddy. Stop me right now. I'll let the angel in. Let this angel talk to me and tell me that you're real, that I better abide by the Ten Commandments, and that I better believe in God and do what's right. But she's been very special to him. I want that angel as living proof that you are their God. And of course to me, because um, she is so full of love. And sometimes I think, maybe he sent the baby. Maybe the baby's the angel. I don't know, I couldn't find a more perfect little thing to be with in my life. And he can holler and yell at her and she'll just go over to him and give him a big hug and kiss and he'll just melt right back down. I think probably Alicia had more to do with my giving up drinking than anything. Every time he got a whiskey, I poured it on the floor. I said, if you don't quit drinking, I'm going to pour every single bottle down on the floor. What I did when I really started to feel bad, and I knew that I was drinking too much alcohol, and I had to do something with my life. And... So I quit drinking, and so I made him quit. <laughs> I really knew that I loved my little girl so much and I enjoyed watching her grow up and being a part of her life. I knew I had to do something. I prayed like for 15 years to quit drinking. So I kind of needed a crutch kind of to help me. Finally, um, after a lady had fasted and prayed along with the ministry. Got on my knees and I asked God that he give me some help and that I could stop the drinking that I was doing. Within a month, he wasn't drinking anymore. Well, I mean, the first couple of weeks were tough, just murder. But I got through it, and uh, all of a sudden, it just became easier for me each and every day, and uh, I finally licked it. I think in all of the 26 years that I've been married to Linda, even though I had to uh, kidnap her to get her to marry me, I really don't think I could have ever found a better wife. I've learned to be thankful instead of be complaining underneath. I used to be bitter and, and resentful underneath. I always had a smile on my face, but inside it was really hurting. There's only one bastard in this family. That's me. So I came to a low point in my life. Never been a bad day with myself and my wife. That was not my fault. I had not a good self-image of myself. I felt like I couldn't do anything right. You know, I saw a motion picture one time called Stepford Wives. Even in that motion picture, compared to my wife, they did not know how to really make a Stepford wife. My wife makes Stepford wives look bad. I used to pray, oh God, please change my husband. <laughs> but he says, uh, no, Linda, you change. <laughs> in 26 years, I have never eaten breakfast or lunch or dinner, unless I wanted to, out of bed. I'm learning to overcome those things with God's help. I could have never succeeded in the business I was in without my wife. We um, try and evil every few months, maybe travel for three or four months. She's got a, a son, Kelly, that's 25 years old. She has a son, Robbie, that's 23 years old. A daughter, Tracy, that's a missionary, that's 21. And uh, this little baby, six years old. Now, one time I was, uh, apart from Linda, just a short time. And uh, the baby and I travel alone in the motorhome by ourselves for about three months. Most precious times and the special times with her are when I get to help her get into her little bathtub and dry her off and hold her in my arms. OK, sweetheart, let's say our prayers and go to sleep. No, I lay me down to sleep. Say her prayers with her when she goes to bed, and kiss her goodnight, and let her know that her daddy cares about her and that I love her. It's just. Uh, I don't know, it's not that I love her more than I did my other children. I think I really just appreciate her so much because I'm older and I'm not out trying to conquer the world and I know how fast my other kids grew up. Golf is really the only relaxation and really the only hobby besides a little freshwater fishing that I have. He still golfs every day. He loves his golfing more than anything, I think. If it weren't for the game of golf, I really don't know what I would do with my life for relaxation and for a hobby. It's just been great for me. I love it. I think it's the greatest game in the world. And I 
thought the best thing for them <laughs> was to keep going on as I was. There's only five things in life that really count. One is believing in God. Two is being a good and loving son to your mother or father. Three is being a good husband or a mate to your wife. Four is being a loving father to your children if you have any. Five is being a friend to someone, a true friend. There's nothing else in life that counts as much as those five things. There have been a lot of kids try to emulate me, imitate me. That's the greatest compliment anybody could pay you. I met Evil and I was hanging around. Robbie was just beginning to get into the business and doing some tours. But three or four of them have ended up dead. Robbie really didn't understand his father. Uh, we uh, had our ins and outs and I left him in 1979 to go on my own. I'm not happy about that. We weren't getting along the greatest. Evil was really worried about him. Robbie was trying to move too fast. And going out there, you know, really made him nervous. And... I'm concerned about my own son. I'm worried about him every time he gets on the motorcycle. He feels worse about Robbie being hurt than he would about himself. My dad comes out there and he gives me advice once in a while, but he knows this is my biggest jump I've ever done, so he stayed out of the way and, you know, I'd rather uh, do it all myself. We came to see Robbie Knievel jump 12 cars, right? Oh 13 God. buses. I was close. It was difficult being the son of Evil Knievel when I was growing up. Um, you know, going through all his pressure, he had a lot of pressure on him. It was, you can understand, you know, if you were, uh, if you stopped and thought about what he was going through all the time. Hope he makes it, I want to see him beat his dad. <laughs> his dad, his dad was good. I seen his dad, yeah. his dad's good. What does it feel like going to see your son, John? Well, he just came from uh, Jacksonville, Florida, and uh, they've been advertising on television that he's going to jump 13 buses here and break my record or tie my record. You make, you make it like a daddy. You make it. He was a pretty good guy, on the other hand, you know, a good father, uh, spent as much time as he could with us. Now he gets here and he finds out that this promotional group from uh, Kansas City hasn't got proper permission from the Los Angeles Coliseum to put the landing ramp down below the, the 40 or 50 yard line. I wonder what the hell harm uh, that kid and his motorcycle are going to do to their muddy football field. Is he as good as his dad? Uh, Better. <laughs> it's strange that the ramps aren't set up yet. Well, I'll tell you one thing, it sure wouldn't have got along with the old man. In fact, he ain't gonna like it when he hears about it. And I had a dream when I was a little kid. I saw a dream, you know, I want to go out and jump over a bunch of buses someday and set the world record because I'm the son of Evil Knievel, that's all. I think the manager of the Coliseum uh, you know, ought to face the responsibility if something happens to him. I grew up down there in the arena you know, with him doing appearances when I was eight years old. He sent me down here to check on it. He want, he's concerned with the kid's safety. Man body ride. I'd just rather be down there fighting the bull than sitting up in the bleachers. If this were Evil's jump, the ramp would be in the center of the Coliseum. In fact, when Evil did jump here, our ramp was in the center of the Coliseum. I'd probably get up to, uh, 25 buses before I retire. When you risk your life, somebody shouldn't be concerned about a football field. They should be concerned about the young life of a man doing the performing. Here's a kid that's pledged on television that he's going to uh, jump this jump for the fans of Los Angeles. He's certainly not going to back out of this thing. I'm thinking about going and jumping the uh, Snake River Canyon in a couple years. And his life is on the line. That's how young kids get killed. They get badgered into something by a promoter. Then the press hypes it up and says that they're going to do it. Then they got to come out and keep their word to the public. My main goal is to go and jump uh, the fountains at Caesar's Palace before I end my career where my dad almost got killed and another guy almost got killed. You know, there was no question about having enough room for the takeoff like Robbie's crowded here. The LA Coliseum's only letting us put the go out so far onto the field and the uh, takeoff ramp feels like there's just no lift. Did I get really nervous and scared for him? Because I have, have a lot of feelings towards him. They end up six feet under. I'm just gonna have to grab a handful tonight. Hope I make it. Hopefully you make it. <laughs> Buddy, might miss. No, I'm not very happy about it. I'm very upset with it. Do you come to all your son's jumps? No, I have never seen him jump without any hands. Never. Excuse me, I gotta go. Right before the jump and the day of the jump, they're a little bit nervous, but you can't really tell the change until like 15 minutes to a half an hour before the jump. And then the closer it gets the more that they change. I get a little nervous after I get out there and get done talking to the crowd. 
they're uh, afraid a little bit, but it's like something inside them. Just it's just they just go out and they do it, even though they know they might crash, even though they're afraid. There is there is something that definitely happens. You know, you're committed, so you're going after the jump no matter what. There's something that turns inside them. The closer to the jump it gets, and they go anyway, knowing that. Just got to get on the bike and go for it. I'm going to attempt these 13 buses tonight. There'll never be another Evil Can Evil again. I got the best shot at it. I got the name. I'm out, you know, to keep the name Can Evil the most famous on one or two wheels. Ladies and gentlemen, Los Angeles, I'd like you all to give a warm welcome to a hero and a legend in every sense of the word. Please meet Mr. Evil Knievel. Thank you. Thank you very much for the nice welcome. It's great to be back down at the Los Angeles Coliseum again to see a lot of my old friends. I made this same jump at about the same distance in this Coliseum a few years ago. However, at that time, the management allowed me to use all of the field. And I didn't come here to this microphone tonight to make any excuses or cause any problems for anyone, but I want to let you know that this Coliseum management refused to let Robbie put his landing ramp out on the field any further than it is. Thus, they cut down his takeoff ramp area. And I think this jump is dangerous for him. I don't know whether or not he can make it or not. All I know is I need a lot more room to try it. I know this. If it was the son of the manager of this Coliseum attempting this jump, he'd have a lot longer runway than my son does. So let the responsibility fall over me. I'm free. 
he stands tall and I see myself younger and wild and I will live on long after I have gone away I took one step to the side but Prime of my life. I'm 47 years old. Uh, I've got a beautiful family. I played marbles. I lost some marbles. I won some marbles. I played golf. I lost some golf games. I won some golf games. I participated in all kind of sporting and athletic events. I won some. I lost some. I performed on the motorcycle. I made some jumps. I missed some jumps, but I'm a survivor. I'm still here. I've made millions and millions and millions of dollars. I've spent millions and millions and millions of dollars. What I'm going to do tomorrow is my business. The life I enjoy tomorrow is my business. I take one day at a time. I think people that have written songs, produced big motion pictures, made a lot of money, and at the age of 50 or 40 don't have that money that they accumulated anymore, that say that they're losers and they can't continue in life, boy, they are losers. But Evil Knievel doesn't think that way. I've got tomorrow to live in the next day, and I've got the benefit of all the things that I've done, all the experience that I've had, all the people I've met, all the friends that I've accumulated, and all the millions and millions of dollars that I have had the privilege of earning and spending. I've got all that knowledge to continue on in life. And to me, that's being a winner. That's not being a loser. If you don't believe me, wait until you see what I do tomorrow. <laughs>